In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will go to the altar of God. To God my exceeding joy. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. O God, creator of heaven and earth, grant that as the crucified body of your dear Son was laid in the tomb and rested on this holy Sabbath, so we may await with him the coming of the third day and rise with him to newness of life, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for Holy Saturday is from the book of Daniel, the sixth chapter. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three presidents, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the president and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, No, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lord, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? 
Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Or let your Holy One see corruption. O Lord, God of my salvation. I cry out day and night before you. For my soul is full of troubles. And my life draws near to Sheol. You have put me in the depths of the pit. In the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. And you overwhelm me with all your waves. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Or let your Holy One see corruption. The epistle is from 1 Peter, the third and fourth chapters. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. The time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Son of Man laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 27th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Next day, that is, after the day of preparation, 
the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Of Jesus. Amen. In all of the season of Lent, this is perhaps the day most forgotten. We observe Ash Wednesday even with the imposition of ashes, a custom that for a long time had not been kept among Lutherans. We observe the Sundays in Lent and the 40 days of Lent 
patterned after the 40 days of Jesus fasting and temptation in the wilderness, which we hear as the Holy Gospel for the first Sunday in Lent. We certainly observe with great joy our Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. Even when we haven't been able to join in the Palm Sunday procession this year, waving palm branches, we found other ways to mark the occasion, such as putting palm branches or other branches out on our doors or the fronts of our homes. We have observed the main occasions of Holy Week, Holy or Maundy Thursday, and Good Friday. How can we not mark the institution of our Lord's Supper, even if we are unable to gather together? He gave the meal to us for our inheritance. And how can we pass by the cross of our Lord Jesus and not hear and heed his words and express the sorrow of what it cost him, our sins, what they cost him. We must meditate on his Good Friday suffering and death because he has done it for us. Even the other days of Holy Week may get some attention, if only from our marking the passage of those days before the big days. Each of those three days has its events and customs. Monday of Holy Week, when Jesus cleared the temple, cleansing it from the uncleanness that had been allowed to enter his father's house. Tuesday, when the religious leaders questioned Jesus on his authority, his view on taxes, on the resurrection, all to catch him in a trap of his own words. And certainly, that all was taxing to him. And Wednesday, of which nothing in particular is mentioned, so on it Jesus surely did, as was his custom, taking time to pray to his Father and to rest. A custom quite laudable for those three days of Holy Week, one which we have followed when we had Holy Week Vespers here at Hope, is to read the Passion of our Lord from each of the Gospels, Matthew on Monday, Mark on Tuesday, and Luke on Wednesday, with John's Passion account kept for Good Friday. But Saturday is for what? Jesus has died. What more could he do? What more is there for us to do except await the coming Sunday? Besides, Saturday is for rest. That's even what the Lord God said about the seventh day at the end of the creation week. Yes, on the seventh day, God rested. So he also did on this seventh day of this Holy Week. Holy Saturday marks Jesus' Sabbath rest in the tomb. Do you ever feel dead tired, like you simply cannot do one more thing? Behold the power and the obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ, even when dead, even after saying, it is finished. Still he kept the Sabbath, still kept the law and the commandment for you. So take courage and strength from him. Let your love and work for him and for your neighbor not rest on your own strength, for you will run out, most assuredly. Rather, draw on his strength for you. 
If Jesus can serve you and is able to obey his heavenly Father even in death, then there is nothing he can't do. He is the Lord, the I Am, who guarded his faithful servant Daniel from harm when he was sealed into the lion's den. We may well understand the sense Daniel had of a government decree saying, you are sealed in here. You may have some of that sense right now. Though you're not sealed in with a pack of lions. But the Lord, the I Am, guarded Daniel for the I Am sealed the mouths of the lions. He is the I Am who submitted to the governing authorities in the person of Pontius Pilate Yet I am went where no earthly authorities have power, descending into hell and proclaiming his victory over sin and death to those in prison, as the Apostle Simon Peter writes. He is the I am whose tomb was sealed with an official government seal affixed, the seal and authority of the mighty Roman Empire and was guarded with a guard of soldiers. It looks almost comical, doesn't it? A dead man whose tomb is sealed with an official seal and guarded lest he come out? Were those soldiers Roman soldiers or a temple guard? Either way, they remained on duty, keeping dutiful watch, not falling asleep. Should a Roman soldier be found asleep or otherwise lax while on duty by his centurion, his captain, the centurion would beat him with his grapevine staff, beating him to within an inch of his life. Should a temple captain so find one of his guards, oh, he wouldn't beat the man. No, he would just set the man on fire with his torch instead. With such a watchful guard and an official seal and bound with linen strips glued with those heavy gums and spices, why, there was no way Jesus would come out of that tomb. I am simply passed through the grave clothes and through the rock sealing the tomb, even with its official Roman seal. He passed through that too. How could he? By what right did he defy the seal and the guard of the empire? By what right did he defy the religious leaders? Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. I am is the holder and the owner of the keys of death and Hades. Governments and men may threaten death and even put people to death. Can they also make them alive? I am can and does. Proof above all proof? The deathless one died. The dead man raises himself back to life. On the bulletin cover is a set of crossed keys, and under them a simple depiction of a tomb with a stone to one side of the opening. The tomb, the symbol of death and burial, is under the keys because he who owns and holds the keys 
has authority over death and the grave. So is the tomb unsealed or is it waiting to be sealed? You can't tell. The tomb of Jesus, the tomb of I am, would be unsealed not for him to come out, but for the eyewitnesses to look in. The stone was no barrier to the glorified body of Jesus. There is a tomb, though, that is and remains sealed. It is also under the authority of keys bestowed when Peter confessed of Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, Peter's confession, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Peter received these keys on behalf of the whole church on earth. And she, the bride of Christ, entrusts the keys into the hands of men called to administer the mysteries of God. The means of grace instituted by Christ Jesus, including his holy absolution, the forgiveness of sins confessed. Those keys are represented in our stained glass windows, for one, in the traditional emblems of St. Peter, the upside-down cross on which, according to tradition, Peter was crucified, and the crossed keys, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And the tomb that is and remains sealed is the ear of your pastor. It is his calling, his vocation, his job to hear your confession and to absolve you. That is, to forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is the same name in which you are baptized. For absolution is an extension of the promises I am made to you in holy baptism. His act in which he seals you with the Holy Spirit for himself to be his child and heir, a member of his family, serving his purposes. And his purpose for you in Christ Jesus is to live absolved, forgiven. Jesus was bound with linen cloths and passed through them, leaving them behind in the tomb. He was also buried with all your sins. Your sins remain dead and buried. Whatever sins you have done that you confess to me, your pastor, I will never divulge. I am bound by a sacred oath before God and his church. And not even the highest government authorities on earth can compel me to divulge what is sealed in the confessional. Your sins lie dead and buried, forgiven, forgotten. They cannot come back to haunt you. Let them remain dead and buried. And let I am, once dead and buried, but risen again forever, rule your heart and mind and life. Repent and confess your sins. Receive his holy absolution and forget your sins. Remember I am and this his holy Saturday, his holy Sabbath, 
his rest in the tomb for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And now I ask you, in the presence of God who searches the heart, do you sincerely confess that you have sinned against God and deserved his wrath and punishment? I I do do so so confess. confess. Truly you should confess, for Holy Scripture declares, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Do you heartily repent of all your sins committed in thought, word, and deed? I do do so so repent. repent. Truly you should repent, as did the penitent sinners, King David, who prayed for a contrite heart, Peter, who wept bitterly, the sinful woman, the prodigal son, and others. Do you sincerely believe that God, by grace, for Jesus' sake, will forgive you all your sins? I I do do so believe. believe. Truly you should believe, for Holy Scripture declares God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Do you promise that by the power and aid of the Holy Spirit you will amend your sinful life? I I do do so so promise. promise. Truly you should so promise. For Christ the Lord says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Finally, do you believe that my forgiveness as a called servant of God is God's forgiveness? I do so believe. May it be to you as you believe. At this point, it has been the custom in this service to invite the penitent to come forward to kneel at the communion rail where I lay the right hand on them, ask each one, how are you named, as at their baptism, and then absolve each one individually. As we are not able to do that under the current circumstances, I now speak to you God's absolution. In the stead, And by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.